So this is about being new. It's not so new anymore, it's 20 years old. But sometimes we forget how significantly different the current set of laws are compared to the previous ones that we had before it. And uh, it is especially when some of these laws are amended or frequently adjusted that we start appreciating the impact it has on the, on the mining industry. So I'm going to, 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 to point out a few things, starting with why we should have a mining industry. I just had a very interesting uh, conversation with someone who is clearly not in favour of mining. But if it were not for mining, there wouldn't have been lights in this room. If it were not for mining, we wouldn't have been uh, able to, to, to carry on with our daily lives. We wouldn't be able to watch sport, and that's a disaster. <laughs> so, uh, we need a mining industry. We need to go back all the time to appreciate what happened in 1994 with the change of the law. Uh, the new vision for the country when it's for, 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 for mining uh, translated in a new law called the Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act. Uh, and since that act was released, it almost felt like a bombardment of new laws that came our way. And it's not only the laws, it's the, the regulations, the amendments. And every time there was an issue, there was a, a change in the law, uh, which makes it very difficult to understand. And then with all these changes, uh, we, we start getting inconsistencies in the way we interpret the law and uh, inconsistencies on what the original intent was for that law in the first place, which is good to consider. And then the final two or three slides take a forward look on what should happen or what can happen. Right, so let's first talk about why we are mining. Uh, to me, it's, it, it is abundantly clear we must mine our minerals. We are, we, we are in a country, we are blessed with uh, a treasure trove of minerals in the ground, and uh, these minerals are our passports in Africa to escape the poverty trap for many. Mining is Africa's roadmap, roadmap to escape uh, poverty, and uh, it's very interesting that 75% uh, of the world's poorest countries are located on a continent that's absolutely so blessed with so many minerals and the right kind of minerals, the minerals that the world really want. In South Africa, we have one of the highest unemployment rates in the world, currently at 25%. Uh, it is growing. The number that's not, in that, that's not reflected in that statistic are the number of persons who have given up looking for a job. And when they are added to the mix, their unemployment rate is closer to 33%. What makes it more alarming is that more than half of these unemployed are the youth. And, and more than half of the youth, and the youth is up to 35, 35 years. Are now that is alarming. In a, in a country where poverty is a real issue, uh, that explains why people are disillusioned, why the youth is unhappy, why the youth is angry, and we could see some of the signs during the municipal protest last year, and this week we could see it at universities. So we need jobs. Mining in South Africa. South Africa is a country that's blessed with many and large mineral deposits. It's one of the top 10 mining countries in the world by volume. Our share of GDP averaged 8% over the last number of years and, ex and exports 30% of foreign exchange. It employs uh, close to 500,000 people still in these difficult uh, times. And uh, if you look at mining taxes compared to the total tax receipt and then mining's contribution compared to other sectors, the mining sector is paying more, more taxes than other sectors in the economy because it's paying 10% of the total tax that tax take and each year it's 8%. So 
we often hear that mining companies don't pay taxes. It's not true. Uh, the numbers, the statistics show otherwise. Uh, this is the global demand for minerals, and there are two ways to do, to do this exercise. One, to see what is the volume, which minerals the world want, and then what's the value of these. And regardless of value or volume, the, the world wants coal, iron ore, gold, and copper. So those are the minerals that the world really want. Getting back to South Africa, uh, it attracts 10% of Africa's exploration budget, so it's one of the countries in Africa that's really blessed with, uh, with, with some nice mineral deposits. The 2015 Research and Resources Institute value indicate that the country that second rank, the DRC, that's of Africa, is three times, has three times more reserves and resource than the, resources than the DRC. And the minerals that we have, gold, platinum, copper, uranium, iron, coal, diamonds, chrome, etc., etc., and the list goes on. If you look at our position in the world rankings, we see that we feature well, several of these minerals in the, fir in the, in the top uh, 20 uh, in terms of reserves, production and the exports. And if you look at the kind of minerals, it's again the minerals that the world really want. So we have a platform for growth. We have a platform for job creation. In terms of uh, South, Africa uh, South African reserves by value, it's a bit skewed by, uh, with our platinum resources, and here we are ranked number one. So, from this perspective, it is absolutely clear in my mind that we need to do more with our minerals. And if we look, take a hard look and, uh, on our uh, uh, capacity to create jobs from our mineral resources, we must acknowledge that we don't live up to the potential of the mineral resources in the country. Getting back to, getting to the law, uh, we, are, we, we live in a country where, where we've been mining for a long time, and the law has went through several significant changes in the past, uh, starting with what happened before uh, the Dutch colonized, uh, or the Dutch arrived at the Cape. Uh, then, uh, during the Dutch era, where a system of Roman law was introduced as the form of property ownership in the country. Uh, then, uh, the British common law system didn't replace the Roman Dutch system. It was a blanket of different type of law that was overlaying, uh, that overlaid the Dutch uh, 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 system. Then the different provinces wanted to do their own thing and they established their own, own, own laws which, had, which meant that the laws of the old free state were not the same as the laws in the old Transvaal and the Cape for that matter. And the British law, these laws were again consolidated but it was only for a short while before the Union of South Africa was established and since then the, 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 there was more consistency in the law of property and the way rights were allocated uh, in, in, in the country. That system basically lasted until 1994. And the one thing that stands out from that, from, from that historic system is the role of ownership and particularly property ownership during that time, where it resulted to, to, to a point where minerals could be owned separately from the land and even the different minerals themselves could be owned uh, uh, separately. On the environmental side, uh, the environmental law came in a lot later uh, than, than, than the mining law, so it was only after 1965 that we really started looking after the environment. And then uh, nothing changed, it was oh, a little bit changed over time, but it was really the 1991 Minerals Act with its aid memoir that caused us to have the first significant law that looks after proper environmental management when it comes to uh, mining. So the product that we inherited in 1994 
uh, first of all, was a complex combination of private and state land. And there were many different categories of, 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 of land. And, and all of these lands that had different rules as to how you should mine and, 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 and what you could do on these lands. There was this land and minerals were separately owned. So the concept like mineral rights ownership existed in those days. Uh, tribal lands, there were tribal lands and uh, mineral rights that were held under trusts like the old and Donyama trust and also on the west coast there were some, uh, some trusts there. Uh, land and mineral rights by the former homelands, they were the TBDC uh, states. These were all like independent states and all of them had separate systems of, 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 of ownership, separate laws and also laws governing uh, mineral development. And then the, uh, uh, so, so the, and, and then the change, the, 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 the shift. To, to a new order that happened in uh, 1994, or after the 1994 elections. It is, it is a paradigm shift. It is completely different. And we are about to enter another paradigm shift. Uh, if the amendment of the uh, NPRDA will go through. It was a drastic change because it was a drastic change in politics. So there was a new vision for the country that resulted in a new policy for the country called the Mineral Policy. It was, developed, it was finalized in 1998. And uh, one of the fundamental principles of this act is a new concept in law. It was one of the first countries in the world that adopted the concept of sustainable development in law. So, the, the, the understanding was the 1994 or the post-1994 understanding of sustainable development. We've moved on. I think today we have a much better understanding of sustainable, uh, what sustainable development really means. But the understanding of that time was legislated in law. Uh, so it had to, to look after the security of tenure issues in the, uh, under the old historic system where mineral rights could be privately owned. There was perfect security of tenure. So a new form of security of tenure for holders of mining rights had to be engineered. And how, it's, how it worked out was that there was the only security of te tenure for those companies who comply with the law. There was a significant strengthening of legislation on safety, health, environment, and community issues. Before this act, things like social plan, labor plan, didn't exist. It was as a result of the, the promulgation of the law that these were created. And the intention was to have harmonious relationships with workers and communities. Now, we know what happened since then. We, we don't have that today. We have communities that are angry. We have workers that are not happy. So, but the intent was good. The intent was sustainable development as it was understood at the time. So there's nothing wrong with the intent. Yeah, oops, sorry. Right, so... Here we are, we have a new picture, new, new country, so we needed new laws, so the first thing to do is to develop a new policy, a new mineral policy, a new vision for mineral development in South Africa, with a new intent, a an intent of sustainable development of our mineral resources, an intent that gives e equal opportunity, whoever wants to apply for mining rights can apply. Don't have to worry about a historic system of ownership that was skewed to a, to, to a few companies. Uh, the intent of sustainable development. The intent of changing the system entirely. And then to bring in a concept of optimal use of uh, our mineral resources. That had its roots or foundation or justification in the constitution. First the interim constitution of 1993 and then the final one of 1996. Uh, which is the supreme law from which the vision was, 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 was drawn, which sets out the principles which helps us to develop an intent for, the, for, 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 for mining. And uh, in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution, 
certain statements were made in terms of people, equality, the environment, property and information that spilled over into the new mineral policy. Now that we had a new constitution, a new policy, it was time to start changing the laws because ultimately it is the letter of the law that changed the system and not the policy. So we needed to start looking at regulations, uh, which, is, which are the, the legal instruments in order to make the change, so to speak. Uh, to ensure the equal access, so that anybody can, uh, can apply for mining rights. So that we can have a system of sustainable development where we look after the environment, we look after people, but we also look after the economics in a system of uh, governance. We had to convert the rights. We had this issue of, 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 of property ownership, and especially mineral ownership, where outsiders couldn't apply to, for, 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 for mining rights if the mineral rights were owned by a separate party. It was necessary to get those permissions. It normally meant a lot of money because it had to be purchased. Uh, convert the rights and then a system of more disclosure of information in order to work towards this meaning of optimal mining. This was the 1994 understanding of sustainable development. I'm sure many of you saw this before. It is fantastic in theory where we have an economic system. In the past we were only worried about economics. But then, I think the first environmental act was the 1965 of the pollution one. That caused us to have a green circle that had to overlap with the, with, with the economics. So we need to share, need to share economics with the environment. And then with the NPRDA we brought in a new system of social, labor, social plans, labor plans, a mining charter to look after the social dimension. And we developed laws that formed a boundary in which this must happen. That's that yellow circle. So now we are on our way to sustainable development. But in the real life, the shape of the circle can be distorted. The, the circle can become smaller or it can become larger. It can cause a bigger intersection or it can cause a smaller intersection. And this is exactly what we are seeing now uh, with, with the... Uh, with the sustainable development. It is more dynamic than what we thought at the time. <coughs> Looking after legislating uh, sustainable development, of now that we have uh, had a vision on what to do, we'll do so we went for sustainable development big time. We went for a system of state sovereignty to replace ownership. And the state sovereign sovereignty had its roots in international law. There were several United Nations declarations that reserved mineral title to the lands, within the territory of the lands in which the minerals occurred. So we had that sorted. We, had, we looked at the system of equal access, equitable access, so anybody could apply for mining and prospecting rights, no longer just the holder of the, or the owner of the mineral right is a, a, a significant change. We had empowerment of historically disadvantaged South Africans. We, the system gave security of tenure because what the Act said is if you comply with the law, then security is guaranteed. Then the minister must. As soon as you don't comply, the must changes into a may. Uh, then there's a system of uh, administrative justice, so there was the, 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 the administrators or the regulator also had certain rules at which it might had to be, uh, in which, which it had to be followed with the allocation of rights. So the old system was thrown out, the old system of rights, and replaced by a new system. Starting, and, and, and the new system had the mining value chain in mind. So it started with early exploration, reconnaissance. The, old, the, the, the original act, the old, the, the old act, did not have a reconnaissance permission. It was something that came in with the new order. The, new, the old order under the Minerals Act had what it was called a prospecting permit. But what's very interesting, if you, start, if you look at the conditions of these old rights, 
they all had many, many durations. And if you look at the new order, they had maximum durations. So, a, a shift. So there is the, the replacement, also called a prospecting permit. Uh, it's called a prospecting right, but a prospecting permit. <coughs> and it had certain conditions, not very different from, from the old ones, but there was a restriction on the size and there was a, a, a restriction on the duration. To fall in line with a new concept of a new understanding of, 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 of optimal mining uh, that limits the duration of rights. Then there's uh, uh, something in between prospecting and mining, which the old laws did not have. Uh, the old laws had a prospecting permit followed by a mining license. Now, what happens if a prospecting, prospecting uh, 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 permit or right expires and needs to be converted into a mining right, and you have a system of use it or lose it, and the economics doesn't allow you to continue. So this new right, uh, in between prospecting and mining was introduced uh, and it's called a retention permit which allows people, which allows holders of prospecting rights to hold on to their rights after the prospecting phase. Just keep in mind that some of these, this is the original, the original permits, the original after the amendment of the, after the introduction of the NPRDA. Since then, some of these requirements have changed. Okay, I'm just comparing what happened in 1994, or in, in 2004 when the Act was introduced. Then on the mining side, there was an old system, an uh, old right that was, uh, this is, sorry, for small scale mining. There was a, 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 a mining permit which was issued two years at the time, effectively in perpetuity. Under the new system, there was also a prospecting, uh, a, 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 a mining permit for small scale operations. Um, but this time it had a limit on the, the, on the duration. So then, because, because the system at the time, uh, what you saw before was before the NPRDA and immediately after the NPRDA. So the, the, the system was so significantly different that we couldn't just use a light switch to say, this is the new order. It was, it was necessary to go through a transition phase, which in the Act is in uh, Schedule 2 of the NPRDA. And basically what that schedule says, it's a long schedule, but basically what it says, it must classify all old order rights. And an old, old order right was any right that was issued by previous laws. So anything. Uh, some of these old order rights were complicated. It was a prospecting right, but because it was in perpetuity, there was never prospecting, they were kind of on on, on, uh, on, on, that, on that land. So it was a very complicated system that had to be changed. And in order to get rid of all the caravan parks, uh, there was a further, uh, further classification. Mining rights, prospecting rights, and unused. Unused meant it, was, it might have been used, but not for the purpose that the original purpose, uh, uh, permit or license was issued. So there was these. So the unused rights, immediately became available for application, for, 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 for new rights. Uh, then, what it included are rights, authorizations, all the rights in the former Transkei, Bukutatwana, Denda and Siskei. It also included privately owned mineral rights, even if these re uh, mineral rights were registered in the deed office as a form of property. Uh, and then, another classification after that, you see, valid and active, and that valid meant that it didn't expire, it was issued legally, and it's almost like, a, like a, 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 a driver's license that's still valid, that hasn't expired, still in the five year period. Valid and active, and then valid but not active, and then the follow, following the unused rights, the valid but not active rights were also made available for new prospecting and mining uh, applications.
So it was not only the rights that changed. A, a, a mining charter was, was, was also introduced as part of the system of law. And what the mining charter did, it, was a, it, it aimed at the social circle of our sustainable development uh, definition. Uh, so the mining charter had certain targets, it had a scorecard uh, according to which it can with timelines for measurement purposes and it had targets. The targets are not, 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 not very important. Uh, the, it's a system of moving to a more equitable way for people holding rights and companies and, and participating in the mining industry. Uh, and it also allowed for community participation in, uh, at, 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 during mining. It was updated in 2010 with a bit more stringent requirements. And new concepts were introduced, like uh, the last bullet there. Incorporation of a social license to practice and sustainable development into the mining chart. So we try to put the, 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 the understanding of sustainable development as it evolved over time into the mining charter. The best way of thinking of what happened is to think of a car. In my, in my, in my view, uh, one, one of the, one of, one of uh, the, bit of, and, and, and I heard this explanation from a lawyer practicing this. His name is uh, Dean Scholes, and uh, this, uh, to me, it makes it very clear. And when he said that in the old system, you could buy any car. It didn't matter what the car was. It didn't matter what the color of the car was. It didn't, it, as long as, as long as, when you put a driver in that. The driver goes back to government and get a license. So in the context of mining, the, 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 the owner could buy mineral rights. But the person couldn't mine the mineral rights before it had a license. And that license was almost automatic. And only the owner of the mineral rights could get the license to, to mine that area. In the new system, the car and the license is one right. So you get the car and the license at the same time. Uh, issued, issued, issued by the same government. Uh, but this time it's called a uh, right to mine. So the government, the, 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 and the government has more control yet. The government can tell you what the car must look like. The government can tell you what's the color of the car. It can also tell you what's the color of the driver. Uh, but the principle is, the bottom line is, the new system is significantly different. It gives the state more control with, during the allocation of uh, mining rights. Is this a complex clutter? I don't, personally, I don't think it is. I think it's a good system with a good intent, with good original laws. Uh, but maybe it's a bit much. Maybe it's a bit much. Uh, we, have the, we have the constitution. From the constitution, a policy developed. From the policy, statutory laws developed. This, this, is the, this is the way law works. We need to follow this, this, this process. The first statutory law was the Mineral Petroleum Resources Development Act, how to issue rights. Then the Mine Health and Safety governs health and safety. This is the responsible way. Then once we, once we were given rights, we need to pay taxes. Uh, through an income tax and the new Mining Royalty Act. Then we need to register our rights because it gives us security of tenure when our rights are registered in some deeds, uh, 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 registry. And, and there were some beneficiation acts uh, that follow, but then, then it gets a bit messy after that because then, they, in addition to the Beneficiation Act, there's also beneficiation requirements in, in the charter. There's beneficiation requirements in the law itself. There's benefit. So then it gets a bit, a bit all over and it gets harder and harder to interpret. So you're looking at that picture, it's certainly not a clutter. Maybe the clutter comes in as, a, as another, uh, in another form. Or is it inconsistent administration? It's not the regulator's fault because Section 4 of the original uh, NPRDA said any, any, any clarification, 
any interpretation of, of, of the law must be consistent with the objectives of the Act. Now, this is where, in my view, some of the problems started. Because all of a, all of a sudden, we had regulators, administrators, who started to worry about the intent of the law and not administering the letter of the law. So they asked themselves, how does this fit into sustainable development? And, uh, 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 and, and maybe the regulator is not perfectly qualified to look at the intent of the law. That's the ministry's job. But what also happened with that was uh, the clear line between the ministry and the technocrats, the regulators, became blurred. So the technocrats wanted to please the ministers and they started to make decisions that they believed the minister would please. And uh, the ministers started to become involved with the administration of the law and that is not a good thing when it comes to consistent administration. Because administration should be clearly, should clearly follow the letter of the law and not wondering why we have these laws. But there are four further complications. Remember, we came from a drastically different system. Another complication was there was a statement in the, in the Act that the Act prevails over common law. And remember, we had a long history of common law since British occupation that came with us. But it's very different now. How does this now work in terms of a, a, a right that was issued, in terms of a contract that was legally bound, that was issued under a previous law? Very, very difficult uh, decisions. Case law lost its importance on the, to the new statutory law, mostly because of that first point. Uh, contract law was very difficult. And contracts could only be declared null and void if they were found to be unconstitutional. So there were stipulations in old contracts that were that carried into it, which made, makes it very difficult to consistently administer this highly complex piece of legislation. So the new way has to do with registering, it has to do with a concept of use it or lose it, which meant continuously and actively conduct operations in line with the purpose for which the, the permission was, was, was granted in the first place. Uh, there, were, there had to be compliance with the terms, of the, of, of, uh, the terms and conditions of the right, otherwise the minister could take, can take the right away. There must be demonstration of compliance through a system of uh, reporting and then there was this section 26 uh, requirement on beneficiation and the first, the first uh, uh, version of the Act was not so strict. Normally it, 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 it gave the option to beneficiate to the minister. Then a later amendment came in, but if you don't beneficiate you must supply a reason. Then a later amendment came in, but it became more strict, uh, more, uh, strict over time, and in the amendment bill, it is at a new level. <coughs> I only have another 50 slides. <laughs> so, so what is this amendment? This is this, and this, so we, we saw amendments, we saw small amendments, but these are, were like one or two sections at the time. But there was one particular amend amendment in 2003 that put the cat amongst the people. That's it. We have tolerated all these amendments, but this specific amendment is an amendment to follow. And if you look at this, it's just a mind that showing which portions, and if you go through the sections, almost the entire act is amended, or will be amended, should this amendment bill uh, go through. So, effectively, a new, a new rule for the game. Uh, and some of the sections were repealed, but if you go through it, almost the entire act is affected by that. Now, there are, there are so many. I'm going to, what I've did here is I tried to group these amendments into three families. And the first family is, is called, it, it speaks to the concept of optimal development. What's the regulator's view of optimal development? 
It strengthened, they strengthened provisions to ensure security and mineral supply for beneficiation, which is a good thing. We need, benef we need to beneficiate, we need minerals to supply into the beneficiation process. We need products for energy supply because we want the rights to, 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 be, to be on. Uh, so, again, okay, it's good intent, it's good intent, but the letter of the law is a bit frightening for some of the companies. Beneficiation is no longer voluntary. It's not subject to economics. In the, in the previous version, you could just have to state a reason why beneficiate, and, and often the reason was economics. In, this, in, the, in the amendment bill, the economics can't be used. You must beneficiate. Regulation of beneficiate, they separate, and there's also separate regulations on beneficiation. Uh, there's mine closure, even if a mine closure certificate is issued, mine, the responsibility remains. Uh, submission of information, the reporting of processing and resource reserve statements, and then uh, for, the, for the petroleum sector, possibly because of uh, hydraulic fracturing in the crew, state, free part, state participation on petroleum development without stating the percentage. Uh, now, that possibly is not a big issue. But the body language is, if there can be free participation in the oil sector, why not in the mineral sector? So that could be just the next amendment. <coughs> the other had to do with the mining and petroleum development rights. Uh, so so there, were, there were the De Beers court case, which caused a, an early amendment. Uh, but then there were also some historic, historic tailings dams uh, that fall outside the... Uh, the regulations of the mineral and petroleum resources development and the amendment bill brings these into the and it treats it almost in the same way as the, the transitional slide that I showed you uh, earlier. <coughs> Extension of retention permits to petroleum, amendments to all. There's not a single mineral development right that's not affected by the amendment bill. Uh, and then a, 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 a fundamental change where the minister will now identify blocks and then invite companies to apply rather than companies who want to apply for rights applying for these rights. It's significantly different. Another one is on the state control uh, issue. The, if you just look at, read through the list, you don't have to read the definitions, just the list of new definitions. There are some words in there that tell you that's the intent. The intent, the intent is control. Words like controlling, conditions, and it's it's it, and, 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 and in several new definitions you'll find this body language that the amendment will sends. Increased powers of the regional manager. The, the, regional, the, the, the board is disappearing. The board is the board that advises the minister. And the regional manager is taking most, uh, over most of the functions of the board. And uh, uh, the, the, there are some capacity concerns in the DMR at that level to say that how will it work if the, if the regional manager uh, makes decisions on these issues where the board previously had a mandate to make decisions on. What's very interesting is on the timelines, generally speaking, uh, where, the, where, the preview, where the current version of the Act gives the state certain days to respond after an application and then the mining sector has, must respond within reasonable, reasonable periods, essentially the two was changed around. So the state's period is no longer determined while the companies have restricted timelines in which they must uh, respond. And then much heavier fines the fines are no longer fixed fees, but percentages of turnover. Reading between the lines, it is changing everything that's not working for the current uh, Department of Mineral Resources. And if this amendment will be signed into law, because almost all the sections are affected by it, we will effectively have a new dispensation with more state control. The result? Of all these amendments, is you start getting incoherence of different policies. Like, for example, one act says you must beneficiate, but another, but, they, but, but there's not power to do that. There's not enough electricity to do that. You start getting these inconsistencies that make it impossible to comply. 
And, uh, so, and the, other, the other thing, we were more concerned about the new minister than what the policy says. Which also tells us we, don't, we no longer look at the policy for the intent, we look at the minister. What's this new minister going to do with the sector? So, I'm not saying that the new minister is good or bad. I'm just saying, look what happened. There was noise about the minister, nothing about the policy. So we are more concerned about the minister than what the policy states, uh, says. Inadequate systemic view on the role of the sector, we never really thought. What we did with the change, the original change of the law, we tried our best, with the best intent, to legislate a system that will cause us to have sustainable development. We really tried, and it's good. It, it was a good attempt uh, to do that. But we never really took a forward look to say, what, how, will, what, will, what, how will sustainable development change? What will our needs be 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line? How do we need to integrate the future community with the mind? Uh, and and, 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 and what, 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 what's the issue of mind mechanization, for example? How will it affect? We never, we never allowed for these hard issues to enter the conversation. And the government were not always able to dovetail its regulatory efforts with some inadvertent. Really, I really looked hard and I tried hard to look some, for some polite language and <laughs> diplomatic language for that line. The bottom line is we have too many inconvenient questions when it comes to the system of mining law in the country. We have this question, will the amendment bill ever become law? Because it's been around now for a while. And if yes, when? Why is the mining charter challenged as bad law in the courts? How to align the charter with the triple B, E, triple B, double E code of good practice? It's a, in my view, it's, we, all these things are valid, and it's right, but should everything be packed into one law? Uh, how, to, how, how does the state see its long-term role? Is there, is there an intent with the free participation of petroleum development? Is there, is there an intent that may spill over to mining? Uh, does, this, does it see more state control as a way to counter the non-delivery issues and the, 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 the leakages, or some people call it corruption, the leakages issues? Uh, what caused, companies under the, what caused companies under the old reg regime to ride out the cycle? Why is it so difficult now for companies to survive the current cycle? Why was it possible under the old system? Are there things there that we are missing that we can use in order to help companies to, to live through the bad times? Is our infrastructure in sync with the regulatory requirements? Uh, why has trust grown at the current levels? This is, this is a sector where no one trusts each other. The expectation gap is huge. And it's not only the mine bosses and the workers, it's everybody. It's the communities, it's the, it's the state, not the, it, 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 it's everybody. Uh, is there a mismatch between the social and labor plans, the document, and what we actually see on the ground? The best question that I have heard in my life is possibly the most difficult question to answer was at the mining in the court about two years ago, where one CEO after, after each other came and they just telling about the wonderful things that they do in terms of the social and labor plan. And there was one lady in the audience from, from Belfort. And she, when, when the CEO of Harmony uh, gave his presentation, he said, can I ask a question please? Where are these houses? Mm -hmm. Is there a mismatch between the plans and what we see on the ground? Why is it so difficult to have a discussion on technology? We are in the 21st century. In the 21st century, we will, we will mine differently to what we mined in the 20th, 20th century. Why is it so difficult? Why is it almost a non-issue? We can't talk about it. It's just then. Why does the illegal sector thrive while the formal sector bleeds? And, and we see it across several, several, several commodities. Then does sustainable development appreciate the dynamic 
and multifaceted challenges of, 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 of mining. So, and there are many, many more. I just started dotting down questions and I, and, and, and I ran out of space and I didn't want, and I made the font smaller as I went along. But I, at one stage I thought, okay, after this the penny will drop. There are many, many more questions. Ultimately, it comes back to this. Mining is a simple game. We have an ore body in the ground, we need to find it. We need to take that ore body and turn that ore body into something useful. Useful means a metal or some kind of product that the market wants. When we do that, we can exchange that product for cash. When we have the cash, we can pay our taxes, we can, we can, we can employ people, we can do many things. But we must never forget, after all the payments are, are made, after all the taxes are paid, something must come out of the bottom. We call it the, end, the net present value in, in economics. Something must come out. And that something must be enough to pay the investors for the risks that they are taking in developing the, the deposit in the first place. Now looking just a little bit into the future, we are, we are, uh, I should wrap up, it will only take another five, ten minutes. Otherwise we can leave it here and you can think for yourself what the future will look like. The patterns of the past, the past definitions of sustainable development are no longer appropriate for our future. We must build capacity for collaboration. We must innovate. If we don't innovate, we're going to find it harder and harder to play this mining game internationally because the old way of doing things are just too expensive for a competitive market in the 21st century economy. We need a systemic approach. We need a strategy for mining. We need to take out the crystal ball and say, how will mining look like in the future and how should we regulate for this future? In order to, to answer that, in order to get to this future, we need to get answers for these questions. We must know what's the role of mining in local economic development. We must know where's the boundary between the mines' responsibilities and municipalities' responsibilities and the state's responsibilities. We must know how can mining assist to address the structural inequity in our uh, country. We must know how to maximize the industrialization opportunities. We must benefit, but we must know how to maximize the opportunities so that we don't say we must do something, but there's in any case not enough elect electricity, but, we, but we, we really want to have a good thing. It's almost like zero harm on health and safety. We are very good at talking zero harm, and we want no harm to workers, but we don't really need it. If you want to see what people in you know, our lecture last year for two years in Japan, it's the first country in the world that I, that I met people who really mean what they say. If we say zero harm, we mean less. We need, mean almost. We will work towards it one day. That's our zero harm. When the Japanese say zero waste, it is zero waste. Nothing. No. If you go to a processing plant, you look for the waste dump, there's nothing. Nothing. And you can see the difference. You can see the fish, the fish swimming at the bottom of the lake. It's amazing. Uh, how do we support mining communities towards fulfilling their livelihoods, our livelihoods? How to balance the benefits with the externalities of mining, the negative things? How do we sustain post mining economies? And, and, and communities, how does the regulatory environment create an enabled condition for prospecting, mining and innovation because if we don't innovate we won't stay in the game. Final slide, uh, we need to accept that we are in the 21st century. We are where we are. We have minerals, we are in the 21st century, we must apply 21st century thinking and methods to what we do. We don't have to apologize for that. We are where we are. We need regime stability. We need laws that can give certainty, even during the difficult times. We must, we must think, how can we develop systems that are flexible to, to weather 
the bad times. So that during the good times, that all everything, the mining industry is doing well, but during, but during the bad times, the illegal industry is doing well. It doesn't make sense. Uh, address governance and leakage issues. Uh, communicate the sector benefits. It was very amusing during the, the nationalization debate that several politicians stood up and said, but the mining companies pay no taxes. But if you look at the numbers, you see that the mining to taxes, mining company pay more taxes relative to the share of the economy than the rest of the economy. So we must have an informed debate. We, we must be careful for, for, for loud voices. We need to inform. It must be an informed discussion. And that's the role of universities. We need to supply that truth to the system. So that, so, so, so that the, the, the politicians, the companies, the, the industry can make informed decisions based on the truth, not perception. Uh, we need to improve administration. There are several. If, if you go through the different laws, there are many, many resource nationalism instruments. That, that, that's there already. We must just see how can we administer these better for more benefit rather than keep on changing the laws because this, this is not working and we want that. Uh, and then when we make adjustments, we have to be careful, cautious with legal adjustments. Especially because people make long term, companies make long term decisions based on that. Uh, this, this shock therapy every time with amendments are not working. Thank you for your